Hello, everyone. Good morning and welcome to our presentation. I would just have to do a um, brief moment of screen sharing here. And there you go. I hope you can see it. So thank you again for coming um, to our presentation this morning and welcome to day two of um, Open Ed Conference. I hope you are having um, a good conference experience so far. Um, first, we'll introduce ourselves. My name is Regina Gong and I am the moderator of this amazing panel of faculty teaching um, foreign languages at Michigan State University. Um, I am the OER and student success librarian at Michigan State and um, I'll turn it over to my to the panelists now. Maybe we can start with Ayman. Hello everyone, uh, this is Ayman Muhammad, Assistant Professor at Michigan State University and one of the your panelists today uh, talking about our experience in uh, building OER. I teach Arabic all levels and uh, along with other um, humanity, integrated humanities courses and we'll do also um, uh, some uh, online and hybrid teaching. Thank you, Ayman. Rajiv? Namaste, everyone. Hello, uh, my name is Rajiv Ranjan, and I teach two languages at MSU, Hindi and Urdu. Along with that, I do teaching for um, SLA course, second language acquisition, graduate courses, and I also mentor Fulbright language teaching assistant. Um, so thank you. Welcome to our panel. Shannon. Hello, I'm Shannon Quinn, and I teach Russian at Michigan State University. And last but not least, Saddam. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Saddam Isa, originally from Jordan, and I, I am an assistant professor uh, fixed term at the linguistics department teaching Arabic. Thank you, everyone. Just wanted to give you an overview of what we are going to talk about today. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll do some introductions and we've already done that. Um, I'll give you an overview of the MSU OER award program because our faculty that um, who is in the panel today were all recipients of our um, OER award. And then we are going to showcase their work. Uh, because, you know, some of them are already published and some are to be published. So um, they're just going to talk about uh, their OER so that you know how to find it. And then um, we'll have some questions that um, I will post and will be answered by, by our panelists. And then lastly, we'll, we'll have plenty of time for you to um, ask questions. So if you have questions, feel free to put it, put it in the chat or um, when the time comes for the Q&A, you can unmute yourself and ask the question live. So the OER program goals. So our OER program is um, going on third year now at Michigan State. And um, like many of the OER program um, in higher ed institutions, our primary goal is really to remove the barrier of educational costs for our students and also encourage and support faculty in whatever way they want to engage with OER. So whether that be adoption, adaptation, or creation of OER. And, and you know, more importantly, provide the technical support infrastructure for our faculty in order for them to successfully implement their courses using OER and empower our instructors in order to take OER beyond, right, beyond just replacing the traditional text, textbook into um, exciting pedagogical process. Uh, practices and models that leverages the affordances of OER and open education. 
So our OER abroad program started in fall 2019. Um, that was when we did our first call for our um, faculty to, to submit uh, applications for the OER award program. It's actually an incentive program for our instructors to encourage them and support them in the use of OER. And we have five categories of award. And you can see here um, the, the award amount that we um, provide for our faculty. So from ad adoption of existing OER to adaptation, creation, most of them are in the creation category. Um, continuous improvement is uh, when faculty creates OER and wants to improve upon the OER that they have created. We also have that category of award. And the scaling up of OER award is for those uh, courses that want to scale across all sections of that particular course. So this is our publishing platform. We have um, pressbooks.edu. We use Pressbooks as our authoring platform. And our faculty here are going to talk about the amazing things that they have done with Pressbooks and those interactive exercises that they have uh, put together in the OER they've created. And these are our titles we have so far. We have 10 titles and more titles are gonna come. Um, there's a lot of work that is already in publications. We are just doing you know, a lot of copy editing and making sure that all of the titles that we publish are accessible and conforms to the university's accessibility standards. Okay, so now I'm gonna turn it over to our faculty authors to showcase their work. I think this is Saddam. So Saddam. Uh, uh, th thank you, Regina, for this uh, wonderful overview. So uh, uh, in, uh, first, we're going to talk about uh, why we have decided to write our uh, OER uh, projects. Uh, me and my colleague, uh, Dr. Ayman Muhammad, teaching Arabic, uh, at MSU have been teaching here uh, for more than seven years. Over uh, this period of time, uh, we were able to uh, get in touch with our uh, students closely in terms of what we call uh, needs analysis, their wants, their uh, lacks, and uh, um, uh, you know, uh, their needs in as far as le learning the language. Uh, so uh, we were obviously using um, a very famous uh, Arabic textbook, uh, which is considered to be uh, probably the best among the available, available ones. But this uh, textbook has its own uh, shortcomings that I can briefly summarize in the following. The textbook uh, has a scattered vocabulary that most of the time students are not able to formulate a homogeneous story if we want to uh, you know, utilize uh, the vocabulary. It has uh, fuzzy cultural topics, irrelevant uh, reading topics. And uh, most of the time, uh, and stimulating uh, videos. So from these gaps, okay, plus well, what we have been experiencing over the past seven years, in terms of what the students want, needs, and, uh, and what they lack, we decided to uh, obviously create uh, um, you know, uh, a platform where students can make up for these shortcomings. We experienced the hybrid uh, component four years ago before we you know, been introduced to this wonderful opportunity, uh, the, the OER project. Uh, so our OER project, uh, over the past two years. Obviously, the pandemic has put some motivations uh, on us to create something that the students can uh, uh, you know, uh, utilize and provide sort of self uh, uh, of uh, uh, autonomy. And uh, in our uh, AR project, in sum, we try to make up for these uh, shortcomings by providing students with activities that would enable them to talk about, for example, self, family, I'm talking about uh, first semester Arabic, uh, their surroundings, 
and also provide homogeneous vocabulary that could you know enable them to create a story about a specific rele relevant topic uh, based on themes thank you Amen. thank you so much Saddam for for that overview just you know please give us an overview of the book that you have available now in our um, catalog and we'll we'll have we'll have plenty of time to to answer those those questions about your motivations okay um Ayman? uh yes uh, about elementary arabic uh, it was awarded under this oer program and uh, we started working it targeted learners of arabic who had just completed building their literary skills so we built this upon the first oer that uh, Saddam talked about uh, this starts after students have co completed their literacy um, and it, it has communicative exercise particularly as h5p which do self check modules uh, and we actually used it in hybrid and uh, online offering uh, in uh, in the last semester, and we are still using it, it uh, for now. Thank you, Ayman and Saddam. So the first one that I showed you is the beginning Arabic. So that one is meant to be for the first semester of Arabic language learning, and this one is on this for the second semester. Um, yeah, so the next one is Shannon. Hi, so I've worked on a couple of different projects that have open materials, but today I'm going to mostly focus on this one, which I call the Russian bridge course. This is the fourth semester of Russian, and the re uh, it's trying to take the beginning textbooks it's when students were in the first three semesters working with the beginning textbook, and then prepare them to transition from that to using more authentic materials. It gives them more autonomy. It gives them the opportunity to continue to learn from authentic materials. And by that, of course, we mean materials not meant just for students, but for native speakers, um, so that they can continue to learn from things that they encounter as they encounter texts and um, movies, whatever kind of text you, you want to call it, um, that were made for native speakers. It also gives them the preparation to join the upper level courses. Um, so the course has three parts. It has language building lessons. It has strategies and tools for reading and listening. Part two, a set of lessons based on Russian cartoons. And then part three, a set of lessons based on a Russian sitcom. That is so interesting, Shannon. Um, yeah, and Rajiv. Rajiv has two. Yeah. So he's so, this uh, right. So um, uh, the, the overview of the book is couple of keywords. I wanted to have the book, which is tech enhanced, interactive, theme based, and informed by current pedagogy. The, 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 this is, these are the four keywords that I want to mention to kind of give the overview, which were lacking from the previous uh, paper based textbook, um, which was expensive and our digital natives didn't find it cool. So to make the Hindi and Urdu language learning cool, which is also pedagogically updated and can be used in a hybrid face-to-face uh, -face, uh, or complete online synchronous, uh, synchronous courses. And uh, uh, I also wanted to inform that um, the, the self-paced, so it's not just for teachers, it's one, anybody who has the access to this book with internet can use it and self-paced learn them, uh, learn from the book or interact with the book because we always talk about interaction between people or teacher and students and students and student. But I wanted to have a book where learners can interact with the textbook itself. So that was my kind of overview I would give and I'll answer more questions later. And the next one is Urdu, which is under the process, the same idea, but what I'm adding more to this is the learning that I had from writing my basic Hindi one uh, and the couple of learnings and challenges um, that occur because it was pandemic. I didn't have many speakers around me so, so that I can record male or female voices. So those are the upgrade in basic Hindi one and the basic Urdu one will have multiple voices and what I learned from the experience of writing the first one. So it's like an updated version. And then I'm also updating basic one after basic uh, Urdu one, then I'll go back to Hindi one and update both of them. Thank you. And, and, and really that is that is the beauty of OER, right? Yeah. Uh, because you, we can always go back and improve upon it based on you know the way you teach or the the, 
feedback that you get from your students. So I'm glad you've mentioned that, Rajiv. Yeah. And so now we go to the part where we have some questions prepared for our panelists in order for us to really get deep, dive deeper into their motivations and how um, they have filled the niche in the little language in terms of OER materials. So um, yeah, so what made you decide to write an OER? Uh, okay, so uh, I uh, partially uh, have answered this uh, question in my uh, first uh, introduction, uh, but I would like to add the following. Uh, historically, uh, when I mean by historically, since I came to the United States in 2006 as a Fulbright uh, scholar teaching Arabic, uh, I've noticed that the students have a great dis dissatisfaction with the current uh, paper textbook, although it's one of the famous, probably the best among the available ones. And that's uh, in terms of providing them with uh, the linguistic proficiency available at that uh, level. Talking about first year, uh, uh, so unfortunately, one of the uh, first vocabulary items that students learn in first semester Arabic is the United Nations. The students were always wondering why we have to learn this. At the same time, to give you some specific example, why students, uh, um, students complain why we are learning uh, colors like in uh, second year. Uh, so students obviously want to, something, as I said in my uh, introduction, to talk about you know, uh, themselves, talk about family, talk about their uh, surrounding, and at the same time achieve the appropriate linguistic proficiency uh, at, at that level. From there, we decided to fill this gap by creating uh, uh, an OER project that is uh, accessible to all students, and at the same time, you know, uh, help relieve the students with the financial uh, uh, burdens, and uh, by also, but but also achieving, you know, uh, or filling this gap, and also enabling the students to reach uh, the appropriate uh, linguistic proficiency. Ayman. Yeah. Thank you, Saddam. Um, yes, I would just add that uh, over the years I have accumulated like handouts and worksheets that has become that I have called handout books. So one of the reasons I put that is, okay, um, I wanted to share these with other teachers as well. Okay, let's take this and work from this, use these worksheets. And they developed gradually. Uh, I put these into the hybrid curriculum and then later on moved to this OER to be accessible uh, by, by everyone. Yeah. Thank you, Ayman. Uh, for me, um, I had originally started because I was uh, already working on hybrid course materials. That was part of my job description. And then uh, a Russian OER came out for the first year. And so I started using that. But there were some things I wanted to do to uh, improve on it. And that's one of the, like we said, one of the beauties. You don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. But you can take something that's already good and then add to it. For the particular OER that we're highlighting today, the reason that I wanted to create something like that was because I always saw a gap between, and I hear this gap, gap the word gap as kind of a, a key word here, a gap between the beginning textbook and then students being able to use authentic materials. That's always a big jump for them to take. And so I, I don't know that I've seen anything that's specifically trying to address that. And so that's what I was trying to address in the particular OER that we're talking about today, the bridge course. Thank you. And Rajiv. Yep. So um, all the ever, but plus more, <laughs> my motivation came from um, as a trained SLA person. And when I started teaching Hindi in 2010 in this country, uh, there, I accumulated material from different sources, but one single book is not enough. Maybe my book is also not enough. But what the motivational part was to have something which is not just giving the linguistic competence, but linguistic, communicative, and cultural competence. So I wanted all the three linguistic cult, uh, and communicative and cultural competence in an easy access way to, to have student um, kind of differential student or differential learning. So somebody might learn implicitly or somebody might learn explicitly. So those sorts of the, uh, the pedagogical or training that I receive as a grad student, um, as, a, as a PhD student in second language acquisition, I wanted to bring it at, at the service of my students and Hindi, Hindi Urdu language learners. So those were the motivations. And um, the, the 
the making it cooler that was really like my student would come in a class and say in spanish we have this or we can play games here and and those are not available for uh, for whatever the reason i don't want to go in that but i wanted to give my learners or students a kind of gamification of the learning experience that are available for the commonly taught languages which are not um, kind of um, in available for for less commonly taught languages so that's the motivation Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. Thank you. Um, and, and can you talk about how you decided on the structure and pedagogy? So I know there's really a lot of interactivity in the OER that you have created. And you mentioned the gap that you are trying to address. That's why you created this OER. So can you just briefly talk about um, the, the structure and pedagogy of your OER and how you decided on it? Uh, thank you. Uh, the key word here is filling the gap. Since uh, the students' uh, gap that we try to fill is uh, bringing them to the appropriate linguistic proficiency uh, level, uh, we aimed at creating textbooks that use the word readiness uh, standards for learning languages developed by the American Council on the Teaching of Foreign Languages Act well, as a framework. These standards, as you all know, are uh, communication, culture, connections, comparisons, and communities, or that are commonly known as the five Cs. So we use these standards uh, as, road uh, as a roadmap for our Arabic uh, OER uh, textbook. The motivation to use these standards uh, stems from its focus not only on language and cultural learning, uh, but also uh, on making connections to other disciplines and maintaining interaction uh, with the local uh, communities. Ayman? Yeah, I would echo the same thing. Like I would add that um, to decide on the structure, one of the key uh, ideas that I had is to have a theme-based organization for students to, to, to work from point A to point Z. So they know where to go, how, how to pr progress from uh, the uh, lesson and what are the objectives and then move to achieve these objectives. And, and this again, echoes in the idea of filling the gap uh, um, to put a structural theme based modules that they can work on uh, self-study and through the online and hybrid component of our class. For this particular bridge course, um, because one of the things that we know is that a lot of language acquisition comes out of input, right? Students interpreting what they hear and also what they read. Um, this is one of the major ways that students can make uh, progress in their language. Um, they, I felt that they needed some scaffolding, some help to uh, be able to interpret these authentic texts and so the first part of my uh, course materials have to do with giving them some strategies and tools to, to uh, interpret those texts. And then what we do is slowly over the semester, we use it with more and more difficult texts. So that's why it makes sense to a certain degree that we first start with cartoons that are somewhat simplified because they're for children. And then the next step is the sitcom where of course sitcoms tend to be very predictable and that helps students with their understanding of it. And so it's kind of a step-by-step -step process to take them from strategies to simpler texts to slightly more complicated texts. So so for me to structure that, I started with the reviewing lots of books and seeing the, the structure and not just the Hindi books, but the many other foreign languages textbook or commonly taught language textbooks and seeing the structure. And, and I started doing that and framing it and Regina helped uh, us to guideline everything, like you know, write down the the whole chapter and what you're gonna do about this. That's really helped to structure the textbook. Just sit together and and brainstorm, like we, what are the activities we can do for like pre-reading, pre-listening, or during reading or listening or post-reading and listening. I also wanted to structure it that so somebody, teacher or a learner, can induce the knowledge or deduce the knowledge from um, uh, that sort of uh, learning. Uh, but a couple of things that I'm really proud of in, the, in my book is having a set goals and a review of the previous chapter and, and a study abroad section, because I also noticed that many of my students, they want to go to study abroad, but they do not have enough infrastructure available 
to go to study abroad or they go there with with clean slate and they do not have much of a linguistics and cultural um, kind of capital to to kind of use when they are first there so i added a sex section on study abroad in each chapter so so that those are the highlight and that's how i structure it i really love how you 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 know foreground the the you know your student experience you know what your student will experience will get out of of the oer and you know it it really warms my heart that um you know our faculty really are um you, their pedagogical uh practices really are student centered and so we we aim really to produce those kind of OER that are not only rich in content but also rich in um, interactivity for 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 our students to do the learning self pace at whatever um, you know pace they are in in language acquisition. So oh my gosh, we have a lot of questions, but maybe we can like um, try to go through all of this. Maybe we have about five more. What was your experience when you taught this OER for the first time? So some of you are doing it now, you know, like for the second semester, but, but what can you say about your students' feedback? Okay, so uh, as I mentioned before, uh, we were piloting some of the materials that we use in our current OER uh, projects with our students uh, through, you know, uh, variety of forms, but one of them is the hybrid component that me and uh, Dr. Ayman Muhammad have launched uh, four years ago. So from th that experience, we've noticed like the, how students interacted with these uh, materials. Plus, we, uh, me and Ayman uh, wrote a paper on measuring students' attitudes of the hybrid uh, component. And we received like overwhelmingly uh, positive uh, feedback. Now we uh, created our uh, OER uh, project. We are more confident about, uh, you know, the positivity that our AR project uh, uh, brings to our students. Uh, but uh, over, you know, the past several weeks, we can tell that the students are really engaged with with the activities that uh, uh, we use in our uh, AR project and uh, they seem to be uh, happy. But I would like to highlight, I would like to highlight briefly that from a scientific point of view, in order to measure the students or gauge the students a proficiency and how much this uh, our OER project impacted uh, students' uh, proficiency, maybe we need to do uh, what's called uh, OPI, a test with our students. Uh, uh, to see whether they have scored uh, the desired uh, levels that we wish from them by the end of the semester through our AR projects. Thank you. And, you know, Ayman, you can add if, if you feel you, you need to add or any of you. Uh, no, I, I, I just say, like, using this, um, we felt it's enriching for the class uh, communication. It it's provides um, the uh, big picture, and then we come to class to uh, activate what we learn. What I noticed just anecdotally that I see students just like I'm teaching them uh, second year now, and I see that they go back and uh, review things from the previous year's OER that they did. So they check, they know where to go and to find this information. I saw this in class happening, although I'm not yet uh, doing the second year OER. So it, it's it's a resource. It's still a resource for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'll just briefly say that I think it makes it a lot easier to do uh, a flipped classroom approach where students get familiarized with particular topics or vocabulary before class instead of spending. And so then you can strategically uh, use your class time for other things. Yeah, yeah. Reggie. Yeah, I will add the that now less of printing so we are cutting the cost of the papers and bringing in the classroom and handouts and stuff. But uh, that's from um, and from student side, I also experienced that students are not Googling things. They, they have an online book that they don't have to go to Google and wander around. They can they exactly know where things are. They can ride a bus and review the vocabulary on their phone, which is also so these are the experiences that students come in and talk to me about it. And that makes me really happy that they're not just engaging in in class, but the outside the class, this book has 
kind of help them to engage. They always wanted to engage, but you have tons of materials available on TikTok and, and YouTube, and but this is not in an organized way. So what this book did is serve the purpose, serve the need of a digital natives in, in the target language that they, we wanna do. And, and they come up with the questions and, oh, I was trying this and this happened. So this was, this is all wonderful experience and our our hard work and support that we have is paying off well for me. Yeah, so so how do you think? So now we come to the to the subject of um, impact, especially on DEI, accessibility and multi multiculturalism. Um, can you speak about how this OER addresses this very important um, topics? And any one of you can can answer it. Uh, obviously, uh, one of the main goals of the OER, but not the only goal, is to uh, you know provide more accessibility uh, to the textbooks. And in this case, in this uh, particular point, we're talking about obviously the financial burdens that resulted from buying very expensive uh, textbooks that I personally experienced when learning French and, and Spanish. But our, our project, you know provides the students with uh, free access to these uh, uh, textbooks. Uh, but it's not only about that. Uh, the OER uses obviously uh, various collaborative modes of learning that acknowledge a student's uh, personal uh, experiences. In terms of the language that we even use uh, inside uh, the, the activities, we try to avoid, you know, using, for example, you know, uh, like pronouns related to only males. We try to obviously diverse to make sure that we are inclusive in our, you know, uh, activities. Uh, also, we try to avoid some uh, controversial issues, you know, spe specifically the cult controversial cultural issues to make sure that, you know, we have really a, a smooth moving uh, interaction. I might I, is something you want to add or Rajiv. Yeah, Rajiv. Okay, so so uh, ev everything uh, that uh, Saddam said is um, uh, we all are trying to do this thing. And the one thing I want to add is because my book was the basic book. So the, if you think about teaching culture, you know, um, we think about the product process and perspective because this was the basic uh, language book, I did not put lots of effort on perspective, but the product and process is there. Um, what it did, um, India about Pakistan. So I did not make like a Hindi for Indian and Pakistan, uh, Urdu for Pakistan. I, I kind of tried to include the whole South Asia uh, culture, uh, which which kind of targets my inclusiveness and multiculturalism. Uh, be, um, but it, amazing thing has happened when I started, like when, you know, when you offer a course and you write a textbook and students go online and say like, oh, what does the cost book, uh, textbook cost? And they may or may not take the courses. But first time I have so diverse student group, African-American student, and there are so many other students that they, they told me that oh, this is cool because we don't have to buy a textbook for this course. So, and they are learning such a less, commonly taught languages, which they, they would not even, you know, heard of. So this is all kind of making my class more look diverse. And uh, the book is is making, the, including them to learn and, and uh, trying to create a multicultural perspective in the classroom. For my course, um, the, the Russian sitcom includes characters who are from ethnic minorities in Russia. And I think this is an aspect of Russian culture that not all students are aware of. Mm -hmm. And so that's a really great opportunity to um, bring up some of these cultural issues. And it also is a way when um, Saddam mentioned the five C's, one of those is comparisons, right? And so one of the things that students can do is then take some of those issues, look at it in the Russian sitcom and say, how is this similar to or different from your experience in your own country and make those connections. So I think that's a really valuable opportunity to bring in some of that diversity into the, the materials. Yeah, and you know, I'm sure you've learned a lot, right? Uh, with this process, with working, um, you know, with me working together as a group collaboratively, um, you know, like just reflect 
reflect on what you've learned from this experience and how can you know you will you'll be a better teacher um, as a result of your engagement with open uh, yes this is very important uh, for me uh, in terms of uh, a uh, sort of uh, eye opening on matters like uh, the design, curriculum design, uh, activities uh, design, specifically activities that will enable the students to, to provide them with immediate feedback. So I know, you know, some about uh, H5Bs, but, uh, uh, you know, being part of this project has expanded my horizon and my experience about the multiple ways where h 5 can be used uh, in our AR uh, projects. So the curriculum design, uh, uh, the H5Ps obviously uh, have a, a tremendous impact uh, on me personally. Mm -hmm. Same here, like um, I would say like learned about practical tools to put things in order and uh, deal with the, uh, the, the software or the press books we have. It, it, it has good capabilities. Um, I'm sure it can also be uh, improved over the time. And uh, once we have like what we need as faculty members, sometimes we are not all the same in terms of um, technology, uh, like working. So this was uh, one of the um, friendly uh, websites. And we, we are hoping to have more of these uh, that to have more tools to help us uh, do more for our students. I think one of the things that I've learned uh, in working with the group, um, our open uh, community, is that at first I was doing this mostly so to save students money, um, and that's what I thought was the main goal. And of course, that's a, an important thing, but I think I've just realized that there are a lot more ways that it can be open and accessible, and not only through um, how much the textbooks cost. Um, I also just wanted to say that I really appreciate that Regina has built into the program, the continuous improvement category, which is the one that I got my award under because so many programs give money or you know give time up front and then forget that there's a lot of maintenance involved and there's a lot of, if you want to improve it, it's, a, it's an investment. And with OERs, it's so valuable that it's um, not like a textbook where you make a print and then you have to wait 10 or 20 years for the next edition. You can keep improving it as you go. And so <clears throat> I, I appreciate so much that you have remembered that part of continuing to improve the uh, OERs. Thank you, Shannon and Rajiv. So I would, I would say my learning was great. I learned that it's not easy work. It requires <laughs> lots of hard works and lots of amazing people as a team. Um, you can start the project, but then there's so many diligent decisions that you have to make. Any work can be improved. And our work, I'm, I'm going to say like my work is not the best work, but it has an opportunity to keep improving as Shannon was saying that we don't have to wait 10, 15 years. Uh, what I also learned is uh, it's really important to tap in your implicit biases about your own teaching philosophies, because if we are writing a textbook as an author, whether it is OER or non-OER, uh, it has to be more inclusive in terms of teaching philosophy, because not everybody is going to agree with you, but if the book can be used by everybody. I'm very proud to say that many community language teachers in New York area uh, because they have more uh, community language teachers and West Coast in California are using the Hindi textbook. So this textbook is not serving the purpose of only MSU student, but it has an opportunity and it's reaching out to the other part of the country and in, even in Canada. So that that's something that we learned uh, and uh, it's not, I'm not done learning. I'm still open for learning and we are, we have a great team under the leadership of Regina. I'll stop. <laughs> Thank you, I have, everyone. Yes, Saddam. I have to, I have to add that uh, the, the idea of creating a textbook has been lingering uh, in my mind since I came to MSU in 2013. And it's something that I have shared with the uh, different uh, chairs we had at our department. But it was really, without exaggeration, impossible to do something like that because of the cost, like writing a paper textbook. Then Regina came with this uh, idea. I really uh, want to take this uh, opportunity to thank you for the support that you showed to all of us. And literally without you, we, didn't, we will not be able to you know, create our OER projects. So thank, thanks to you.
Oh, you are welcome. You are welcome. Thank you. Uh, wow. I see that there's a lot. Um, yeah, so maybe your last, last, um, not last, but, you know, just, just a bit of advice to, to, you know, language teachers out there in this room or, you know, because this is recorded, they might watch this um, later. What is it that you would like to tell uh, language instructors about using or creating OER? So uh, I will tell them, uh, don't try and don't be afraid. Uh, if there is a will, there is a way. Uh, that's one thing. So, so another thing that Rajiv has, uh, you know, indirectly hinted that each la each language uh, teacher has his own vision. So sometimes we are confined with the visions of the current authors for the current paper textbooks. And now I think we are uh, we are presents you the opportunity to you know, present your, your own vision. And it could be marvelous. It could be better than other visions. So that's my sort of advice to the language instructors about using the OER. I love that. Don't be afraid. Okay. <laughs> it has to be like a slogan, right? Don't be afraid. <laughs> Don't be afraid. I would add just, just do it. I mean, <laughs> yeah, nothing. Uh, to add other like things gonna happen that may hinder your uh, progress, um, uh, especially if there is like uh, bureaucracy sometimes and uh, program coordination. So things happen, but you need to prove your point and move on. I just think this is a great uh, way to have us collaborate because so many of the co more commonly taught languages find it a little easier to collaborate because maybe they have a cohort already at their university. But for many of us who teach less commonly taught languages, maybe there's only one person or maybe only a handful of people at each university. And so this is a way that we can cross between institutions and um, pool our resources so that more students are able to access the less commonly taught languages. Yeah, um, my suggestion for using a OER is like when you when we instructor when are especially less commonly taught language. You heard all of us that we gather material from different books and make our own, print their own, and bring that to the table. Uh, so why not use the OER material if it fits your teaching style and teaching you know strategies and and it's for free for creating an OER it doesn't have to be the textbook right uh, it it can be anything it can be a student um, kind of collection of their work and you can improvise that edit that and it would be a collection of their work that will motivate the future student and and it you build on that because you have login and password and it can create their own material by the student for the students so it's like very democratic process in in terms of creating the oer material for the for the learners so i'll stop that's my slogan oer <laughs> is a democratic process oh my gosh thank you thank you everyone this is such a rich conversation and i am seeing a number of questions in the chat so um i'll read some and you know answer it whoever want to answer it um Z zachariah um, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Um, ask, do you inform students about how their input historically has, has informed the creation of these materials? So I guess, do you tell your students that, you know, when you are creating these materials, are you incorporating their ideas for improvement? So I can I can answer that very quickly because I think this is my lived experience. Basically, we are less commonly taught language, so we do not have 30 students in a classroom. So what I used to do is like every four weeks, I'll meet each and every student and ask them what how how are you doing, you know, and stuff checking in with student and their feedback and and based on that, I'll change things. So this OER textbook has also kind of given them a space and, and make things look more visible that what I'm trying to do for their benefit. So so um, our basically in less commonly taught languages, we are serving to the needs of each and every individual student. So, so that really helped and the textbook did help. Yeah. 
We uh, have another question here. How do you fit creating OER in your already busy teaching schedules? You don't sleep, right? <laughs> I, I feel like summer is a big a part of being able to update my course materials in general, and this is part of the OER as well. I'm probably the only person here. I actually do have a little bit who actually has a little bit of my um, assignment towards curriculum. So um, that's been an important part of me being able to create um, a lot of materials and hybrid materials for my students. And Shannon, while you're here, um, Sarah Sweeney asked, so um, you mentioned about the sitcom, right? Cartoon. So do you use copyrighted content? Um, yeah, the, the cartoons, any openly licensed authentic materials. The cartoons and the uh, sitcom are both copyrighted things, but they are things that I can refer to uh, and send students to like the, uh, the um, official posting of them. And then I create course materials around them. Yeah, and Amy asked, um, how about like in press books, right? So you you author your OER in press books, um, typing in other alphabets, especially right to left. It looks like that is one of the built-in interactive activities. So like the, the the alphabets rajiv yeah so i mean ayman and saddam wrote the book in arabic i wrote in devanagari and arabic script um so so for me um it didn't seem much of a trouble and pressbook does support the foreign script um that was also a big relief for me because it didn't want to romanize the language so um it works yeah and, and Zachariah asked, uh, do you have course markings that indicate that the course is using an OER? Um, not yet, but it, it will be, um, you know, in the future, MSU has just transitioned to a new student information system. And so we're still in the process of integrating all the uh, numerous systems that the university has. And so um, maybe as a phase three of <laughs> the OER project, that is really my goal to be able to um, have um, students search for this OER courses at the point of registration. Um, okay, we have another question here. Did all of you from the different languages get to meet and share ideas during the process? Oh my uh, yes. Actually, uh, yes. Uh, so me and Ayman have met, for example, Shannon, uh, our uh, Russian professor uh, in the same department. Uh, just uh, that was at the very, let's say, uh, preliminary stages of writing our OER. Uh, we tapped onto her wide experience on teaching online and uh, hybrid teaching and learning. So we did meet. I would add one more thing that before even I knew the word OER or Pressbook, Shannon was our tech guru. She introduced us H5P and I attended her talk and and like the technology wise, she, she, she educated not just me and, and panelists here, maybe most of the department, you know, fix some faculty that we are engaged. So thanks to Shannon, shout out for her. Yeah, and I think in, in the program, in the linguistics and languages program, you have a very good collaborative spirit. And so actually, um, all or majority of our lang faculty in the languages program are now working on their OER projects. And MSU is going to be a leader in OER in foreign languages because they are really committed in, in teaching um, with OER, right? And you know, we always meet with our open pedagogy learning community. And um, yeah, so I really am very proud of the community that we have um, out in the open at MSU. Yeah, so if do you, you know, we, we still have five minutes in the panel. Um, you know, is there anything that you would want to, to ask? And maybe last words from, from our presenters. 
um, about you know future plans for for your OER. I see your hand up, Saddam. Uh, yes, actually, you're reading my mind. <laughs> so something <laughs> something has to deal uh, something has to deal with the future. Uh, you know, when uh, Regina talked about the over, uh, overview of uh, OER, uh, there was something about you know enhancing our OER projects. So there is uh, there is a window that she offers uh, for us uh, to enhance our uh, current existing OER projects. Why? This is logical because we created our OER projects. We are interacting with our students. Yes, probably we have uh, sort of an impression about the students' uh, feedback and the effectiveness of the activities that we are using in our OER projects. But it is also different when we are completely implementing our OER projects. And this also could lead to ideas for us to improve. And we have the support to do that. So uh, I, I appreciate that. So me and Ayman, we chat, chatted about it, let's say about two weeks ago, about enhancing our current OER projects, you know, by, you know, maybe integrating more authentic videos. We might be traveling to Jordan and, and Egypt in, the, in this coming summer, hopefully with the pandemic, will not prevent us from, from doing so. And we are planning to integrate authentic video videos in our OER projects. And this way we, st we have a room to enhance our existing OER projects. So to reach to, to a more perfect, uh, let's say, uh, text box. Shannon. Oh, so um, I, I was gonna say, Shannon, if you wanna, but um, go ahead, Shannon, then I'll- Shannon, take. yes. Oh, I didn't have anything in particular to say. I just was answering Manisha's question in the chat about the okay. syllabics. I looked it up. <laughs> okay. So what I was going to say, Regina, is the plan is that Hindi and Urdu and basic Hindi too is, is awarded from India Council and then uh, helping other uh, least commonly taught languages. You know that I'm supervising Turkish, Uzbek, Vietnamese, Khmer, and Indonesian. Um, so I'm helping these language teacher collaborating with University of Michigan. So MSU, thanks to Regina again, uh, collaborating with University of Michigan. I'm supervising those language teachers, not like I have to teach them how to teach their language, but if they need any help or the pedagogical help um, uh, and uh, technology wise H5P or any technical glitches or anything that I can offer to uh, to make it possible to reach out to the more diverse and make the OER as a project more um, multicultural and multilingual. So that's my future plan with OER. I mean, for my future, I'm continuing to improve the things that I have. Um, I've created uh, for the, the OER that we already used for our first year course that was not written by me. Um, I did some things to improve it and I'm continuing to improve that. Um, I also have a project that I did in the past called Real Life in Russia, which was preparation for study abroad. I started thinking whether I should maybe put that on Pressbooks as an OER as well. Yes, yes, we'll, we'll make that happen, Shannon. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for taking the time to attend our a panel. I know there's a lot of really good presentations in the same time slot, but I'm really proud of the work that our faculty has been doing to fill in that gap, that hole, especially in the less commonly taught language. Thank you so much for uh, Regina for moderating, putting up this panel. I think it was fantastic. And you can see with the engagement, uh, so many questions we have received um, from the attendees uh, from all over the world. And um, thank you for showing me um, the indigenous uh, languages in different scripts uh, on press books, um, uh, which are available for other, uh, if we want to apply the same best practices framework and model to other languages. Uh, thank you so much. Hi, hi, hi. Once again, Ms. Tahi Nina Naskamon Pematas Sowen Emikosian, which in plain Cree Y dialect uh, here in Muscochese means we are very grateful that you shared with us uh, your best practices, experience, frameworks, uh, your resources. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you, Regina. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Manisha.